I'm Dr. Amol Gupta, and I want to thank you for joining me on another episode of The Medicine Mentors, where we interview masters in medicine, leading physicians at the top universities across the United States to learn from their experiences and derive key insights, traits, and best practices that can guide medical students and residents. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Thomas Radomsky. Dr. Radomsky is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Clinical and Translational Science within the Division of General Internal Medicine and Center for Pharmaceutical Policy and Prescribing at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also the Director of Academic Programs and Clinical Research for the Institute of Clinical Research Education, where he oversees all master's and certificate level programs in clinical research training and co-directs a course on strategic leadership in academic medicine. As a practicing general internist and health services researcher, Dr. Radomsky's research focuses on ways to accurately measure and reduce the delivery of low value care and how the receipt of care across multiple healthcare systems influences health services utilization, outcomes, and value. His research has been published in many internationally acclaimed journals, and he's also the immediate past president of the Society of General Internal Medicine, Mid-Atlantic Region. Thank you so much, Dr. Radomsky, for giving us an opportunity to learn more about your life story and experiences. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. So, Dr. Radomsky, you have a career full of successes, and I'd like to start from the beginning, from your childhood, because childhood seems to be a very formative time of our life. Share some of your childhood experiences and how they've helped develop you as an individual on your career. Absolutely. You know, I think it really comes down to, you know, down to my parents and just the extent to which they instilled in me the belief, if I stayed with something, worked hard enough at it, um, that I could ultimately achieve it. And I think, you know, just reflecting back on my childhood, this is a notion that I, you know, internalized fairly early. And, you know, just this belief that to stick with something that you would achieve it ultimately. I think, you know, related to that too, just this notion about goal setting as well. Sometimes it was just, you know, asking me, you know, what did I hope to accomplish, you know, by participating in, you know, this activity or this organization or by pursuing a certain project. Just really, you know, just, you know, really instilling me this notion that by setting goals and working hard that I could take control over a situation and that I wasn't, you know, just someone that was participating in some club or or doing something. and And I wasn't reactive that, you know, I could take charge, that I could be responsible for my own destiny, you know, in many, in many respects. And, you know, I think this is something that has really stuck with me. And something that I have applied really all throughout my life and career and something now that I have two young kids that I'm that I'm hoping to impart upon them as well. You're in in the research field when you work hard and when you want to take control of over your destiny and you put in everything that it takes, but then you get a rejection. How do you deal with that? The first thing I would say is that, you know, rejection in academia comes in in many shapes and forms. You know, there's that kind of the ultimate rejection that we think about, you know, in terms of having a paper rejected or maybe getting a score that was lower than what you expected on a grant. But there's a lot of, you know, a lot of kind of small rejections, if you will, that lead up to that. You know, sometimes you're looking for feedback and you get very negative feedback on something. You know, sometimes your leaders in your institution, when you're floating an idea, you know, may not be, you know, hugely receptive of it. It's true that rejection is something that both in small ways and large ways you have to deal with in an academic career. And you know, I think what it ultimately comes down to are cultivating, you know, the tools and the resilience, you know, to succeed and push through those situations. So much of, you know, research, you know, is about just, you know, coming up with that great idea, you know, asking a great question, but then making sure that you have the ability to, you know, really apply the correct methods, you know, assemble the right team, you know, to make sure that gets done in the end, and then put all the different pieces of the study together. And, you know, if you're working with the right right people, you know, especially if you have the right mentors on board, even if you hit some bumps in the road early on and you have some initial rejections, you know, having the humility to, you know, read the comments that you receive, being open to the fact that your reviewers might actually be correct in that, you know, when people kind of outside your bubble look at your work, you know, maybe it's not as wonderful as you thought it was. So being open-minded, you know, to that criticism, being receptive to it, 
and really looking to try and better your study, you know, and in some ways better yourself just as a researcher, you know, from the feedback you get. Once you can embrace that, that's when you start to get to work and think about the improvements you need to make to the paper or to the grant or what have you. And then you really start to put those improvements in place. And that's where the tools come in. You know, if you have the research training, if you've put together the right team, if you have the skills to lead that team, you can make those necessary changes and give it another go. And often in that, you know, second, third submission, you know, whatever it is, if you have all of those elements in place, you know, then you can achieve success. Talk to us a little bit about your experience with mentorship. Who are some of the mentors who have played a big role in your journey? When I think about, you know, various mentors that I should say were and are very important in my life, I I put them in a few different categories. And so there are those mentors that you identify with certain segments of time, you know, in your career training that tend to be your primary mentor in those situations. And, And those individuals are really the individuals that, you know, they're, they're the ones that are going to get in the weeds with you. They're the ones that are really going to help you, you know, refine your ideas, make sure that, you know, your, your papers, your grants, you know, whatever it is, your clinical practice is really in order and set up to succeed. You know, they do the most handholding, I would say, of anyone. And they're the ones that are most likely going to lift you up if you have a moment where, you know, you might feel discouraged. When I think about people who have filled those roles for me, the first person that comes to mind is Dr. Walid Jalad, who's an associate professor at Pitt, and he's the director of the Center for Pharmaceutical Policy and Prescribing. And he's been my mentor through my general medicine research fellowship and also on my first four years of faculty. And he's been instrumental, you know, in my success, you know, just helping me really with, with almost any project that I've picked up, but also encouraging me to, you know, look beyond the work just that he and I do to expand, you know, the reach of what I do as an academic physician. So that's just, you know, that's just one individual, but there's, there's kind of another, another group of individuals that I think of as kind of almost the people to which you aspire to become. So you have direct contact with them, probably not as frequently as you do your your primary mentor. But these are people that you've worked with at some facet of your career and that have really, you know, influenced your choices and serve as, you know, almost, you know, targets for you in terms of where you hope to become in your career. So two individuals that come to mind. The first individual would be Dr. Phil Masters. I worked with Dr. Masters when he was on faculty at Penn State College of Medicine. He now works at the um, the ACP. And we worked together on a longitudinal outpatient general internal medicine rotation my fourth year as a med student. So every Thursday afternoon, I would drop whatever I was doing and I would go to his practice and see his patients. And at the time, I I knew I wanted to do internal medicine. I probably told most people I wanted to subspecialize at the time because, you know, that's just what you did. You you just kept going and going until you were a super specialist. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity to work with him in his clinic and I loved it. You know, it, it was fantastic. You know, I really got to see what it was like to be, you know, an outpatient general internist practicing at a high level being very, you know, cerebral about your patient's problems, taking complete ownership, but, you know, at the same time working hand in hand with consultants. And, and I got to see how his patients responded to that and the, and the relationship that he had with them. And, and, you know, even though the following year as an intern, I, you know, still considered a number of different subspecialties, I just kept going back to that experience and, and what, what it was like to be a general internist. And one other individual along those same lines was my um, former division chief at Pitt, Dr. Wishwa Kapoor. He had been the division chief at Pitt for um, 22 years, you know, before he retired. And he was kind of your, your consummate clinician investigator. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with him early on in my second year of residency. The fact that as a very accomplished researcher, he was still an excellent clinician. And he really just opened my eyes to what a career as a clinician investigator in its multiple different facets, you know, could be like. Fortunately enough, he hired me a few years later. You know, he's since stepped down from that, you know, from that leadership position. But but he's someone else that I that I really think about when I think about, you know, who has inspired me along the way. Now, you have not only focused on research, but you're also directing a leadership program for students. Can we talk a little bit about this leadership program and what leadership really means at our level of education as medical students and residents? How is that a muscle that we can build or exercise? 
I co-direct a course, Strategic Leadership in Academic Medicine. And this course is really geared towards fellows and junior faculty, but other people could potentially take it, students and residents, if they're participating in the um, the overall degree and certificate programs. And it's really geared to instilling some you know, leadership principles and tips for success you know, that you can apply in your day-to-day work as a researcher or as a clinician educator. It, the program's not just limited to researchers. We also make it available to those in our clinician educator track. But to really you know, appreciate those core leadership principles early on, how you can adopt them and integrate them into your you know, day-to-day activities in your professional life to alter your trajectory early on and become identified as a leader and achieve a greater degree of success than you otherwise would. And what are some of these tools or tips that you've found to be the most high yield? So what I think is most important and foundational is appreciating your personal attributes as a leader. You know, what is it about you? What makes you unique as a leader based upon the sum total of those attributes? Do you have the ability to to relate to people and inspire them on that level? Are you a great arranger, coordinator? Are you someone that can take multiple different pieces of the puzzle and put it all together to really achieve success, you know, at an organizational level. What are your attributes as a leader? How can you, you know, really own those and apply those strengths to the fullest, you know, in situations where you are leading, but then also recognizing areas where maybe you aren't as strong in and making sure that you surround yourself with other individuals on your team who round out those areas or find mentors who can help you round out those areas in yourself. And then how to address, you know, adversity and help a team overcome setbacks in whatever work it is that you're that you're trying to accomplish. Can you share with us a story of, of somebody who has gone through this experience? How has it changed the way they viewed themselves or how have you seen them progress as a leader in their own personal journey by implementing some of these tools? I think sometimes, you know, people forget that, you know, certainly to be successful in academia, you ultimately have to go on to lead a team. And you might not be the person directly, you know, executing your research, but you might be the one supplying the ideas, you know, writing the grants, and then you have a team that's ultimately executing that. And I think just what I strive to do is help people understand that, you know, we are all leaders. And even if you're just a clinician that's looking to practice in the community, just in our interactions with patients, in our interactions with our staff, you know, we are leaders, you know, whether we're thinking about it or not. And embracing that notion, you know, and developing skills, you know, surrounding that makes that aspect of our career that much easier for us. And it can really help us grow professionally as well. In all of the students and residents and other individuals that you have taught, what have been some of the traits and habits of the most successful or individuals who have gone on to have the most promising careers? I would say the most successful, whether it be students, residents, you know, with whom I've worked, are the ones that have really been goal-directed and take charge of the situation, whatever it is. And I think that can manifest in a couple of different ways. So on the wards, for example, you know, I'm always very impressed and, and honestly inspired on many levels, you know, by the students and the interns that really take ownership over their patients and go out of their way, you know, in service of patient care. And that always take the initiative in that regard. And, you know, use myself, use the senior resident as people to that can support them. But that, you know, there's no question that they they are really, you know, in the lead for that patient. I would contrast that to students and residents that sometimes turn it on, so to speak, when the attending is in the room, you know, that maybe they ask the attending a lot of questions or, you know, they might participate in rounds, you know, but when it comes to their patients, you know, they'll give a good presentation during rounds, you know, but they've never been back in that room. Otherwise, they don't know the family. And sometimes some students just need to make the leap from being kind of a a classroom student to actually working in the clinic and understanding that. But it's the students that are, you know, fearless when it comes to patient care and going out of their way for patients that I would say, you know, really, really do the best. And similarly with research too, the trainees, you know, now thinking about fellows and even junior faculty that really take ownership over their project, that really, you know, work hard to develop that research question and the approach and always, you know, bring their own ideas to the table. So out of all of these things that you've told us, if I were to ask you to maybe cone down to one thing, 
one thing that you today know after all these years of experience is absolutely critical to finding not only success, but fulfillment, as you mentioned, in this career, but which you may not have known of as certainly when you started medical school, when you started residency, what would that be? If we're thinking about, you know, what's going to facilitate the greatest degree of growth in ourselves, it's really about, you know, embracing and working through uncomfortable moments, you know, situations that make us feel personally uncomfortable. You know, I can tell you that in my clinical practice, I have some patients that if you just looked at the chart, they would probably by many people be classified as a quote unquote difficult patient. But when you actually spend the time with that patient and get to know them and develop a relationship, those are actually many of the most meaningful relationships that I have developed with patients because you cut through a lot of what's on the surface and really drill down to to help that patient wherever they're at. Similarly, on the research side, whether it's been reaching out to an accomplished researcher to ask for their assistance or you know advice on a project, in the end, you're always glad you did these things. I'm going to try to summarize what I've learned from you in three or four pearls of wisdom. One of the, the key things I learned is that mentors are really of two types. One is the mentors which are more profession, career oriented, and the others are those who help who we aspire to become like, our role models. And many times we only think of this category one as being our mentors, but the, really these role models and the softer sides of medicine, uh, we imbibe through just thinking about them and trying to become like them and slowly we start to become like them. Another really interesting thing that I learned today is what is the foundation of leadership? It's not about directing other people or say, standing on a stage and giving a great speech. It's really about the foundation is who am I? What are my strengths? And do I have the right people around me to cover for my weaknesses? It's about introspection more than it is about you know demonstration. The third thing, when we talked about appreciating and embracing the uncomfortable situations, and I'm very grateful and, and thankful for you to, to come on with us today. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. To our audience, thank you for tuning in with us here on The Medicine Mentors. Thank you for joining us as we learn from the masters of medicine.